feel like an astronaut with all these <laughs> recording devices on, so uh, I'm sure you can hear me because I can hear me. <laughs> and as I get older, that's uh, becoming more of an issue. Uh, thank you. You'll notice that I have somewhat of an accent. And uh, so if you're not used to someone speaking from the South, I'll speak slowly <laughs> so you can, you can interpret as, as I go through this. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. I love this part of the country. I love to come here and fish. My friend has set me up fishing several times and uh, just love this part of the country. My father-in-law grew up in Chalice. I think it's Chalice. Is that right? Uh, I'm not sure I'm saying it correctly. And uh, so I told him I was coming here and he was all excited and brought back all these stories that took way too long to tell me, but <laughs> it was enjoyable. I want to spend a little time today talking about what's the current environment. Um, we are facing uh, some major challenges as nonprofits. Giving to nonprofits, uh, other than exceptional giving for like uh, Sandy in New Jersey and New York, all other giving is down. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. And uh, it's been a trend for the last four or five years. We are finding that the, the income, discretionary income gifts has dropped fairly dramatically. What has kept us somewhat up has been estate gifts, where people have, uh, in fact, it's been the last 20 years, eight of the 10 largest gifts each year have come from estates, where someone had passed away and left a large amount of money. So I want to talk about the current environment, what we're seeing as far as tax law. We have some pretty good connections in that uh, I just finished the estate for the third time of a senator on the Senate Finance Committee. We're working with a congressman who is on the House Ways and Means Committee. We're kind of hearing some backroom discussion of what's taking place. No one knows what's going to happen as far as taxes, but we are hearing some of the stories that are fascinating. And uh, I would suggest that as we go through this presentation that uh, our, our work is really cut out for us. This is, uh, this is my 30, I'm starting my 38th year of being involved with nonprofits. And for many, this has been the toughest two years. And I think a lot of it has to do with we're guessing at what needs to be done rather than being strategic. So we'll talk about that as we go through this. Uh, hopefully we'll go through this. All right, I'll do it this way. What we're seeing as far as taxes, uh, we have any attorneys in here, estate planning attorneys or accountants or whatever. I wish we did because what we're seeing is a, a significant change in how people are planning their estate. It used to be the biggest tax everybody was afraid of was a state tax. Well, right now, a couple can give away ten million six hundred forty thousand without paying any federal estate tax. What has changed is that states are becoming more involved in taxation. They're seeing uh, money that normally would come to the state of Idaho or Tennessee, where I live. When someone passed away and they collect federal estate tax, some of that money would come back to the state. That has been decoupled. That's no longer the case. And uh, we're finding that actually taxes collected on estates has gone up while the credit has also gone up. And that's because more and more people have, their, have built their wealth in retirement accounts, which are still subject to uh, federal income tax and state income tax. So I want to talk about uh, what are we seeing as some of the more uh, challenging things that are happening. We're finding that estates are becoming more complex. The estate plans are becoming more complex as people are doing a little better job analyzing what they have and what can be done. And we'll see in a few minutes that there are a number of challenges that all of us face. And one is, uh, what do we want to do with our estate? And what's the best way to manage it and leave it for our heirs? So we'll talk about some of the tools that are currently being used. And we're finding that um, if you look at the United States and you look where Many of the sophisticated plans have come from, they come typically from the Northeast, Florida, Texas, and for some unusual reason, Seattle and Portland to some degree. And what we're seeing is what has been used by people with exceptional wealth is now moving into the South, the Midwest, and this part of the country, Idaho, Montana. We're seeing a lot of work in Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, uh, to some degree in Colorado. And it, the, a lot of the techniques we use are not typically used in this part of the country. I can't tell you why. But we've seen a dramatic change in the last five or 10 years on doing that. We'll talk about why those tools are so effective. And 
the most important thing I can share with you today is that it is going to become more challenging to raise money in the future than it has been in the past. There's a lot of reasons for that. I want you to think about the Sun Valley area. How many nonprofits are less than 15 years old in this area? I don't know what percent it would be. But you have a lot of them. I think there are like 300 nonprofits in, in, in this area, 150 nonprofits in this area. I'd like to know what percent are fairly new. 80. 80. 80. So think about this for a second. As the dollars to charity are going down, the number of nonprofits are going up. So it's make it more and more competitive. There are more and more challenges. And nonprofits uh, are very often not well trained in how to be successful at fundraising. So that's another challenge unto itself. So I've, I, what I've decided to do is I'm, I'm hitting 62 in December. I know I look a lot older than that, but I'm hitting 62 in December. And I really want to end my career by helping nonprofits in, in general, not just with uh, gifts from estates. So let's talk about some of the effects on charities. Uh, we're going to find that discretionary income gifts are going to get harder and that estate gifts are going to go up, and there's some logical reasons why that's true. Fortunately for you all, you're on the leading edge of that. You got in, I tell you what, you got in at the perfect time and you've maximized your potential. You're right on it. And uh, for the board members who decided to do this, what, five years ago? How long has it been? Five, five years ago. Whoever's on the board five years ago, you are so far ahead of the curve. Healthcare is where universities were 30 years ago. When I got in this business, universities were trying to figure this out. The growth and endowments in universities in the last 30 years has been staggering, and it's not by accident. It was intentional. It was an intentional desire that you'll see being fulfilled in a few minutes. So the challenge is for most nonprofits is that they're understaffed and they wear too many hats. Now that may not be the case with your organizations, but I'm telling you the vast majority we see, they need more staff and they need to be better supported and wearing fewer hats. So we'll, we'll see how that turns out for everybody. Okay, so how are you gonna be successful in the future? Well, there's no surprise to this. It doesn't matter what your endeavor is in life. If you're gonna be successful, you have to have a plan and you gotta execute that plan and you gotta evaluate that plan as you continue to grow. So many nonprofits just do what they've always done year after year, year after year, hoping that they have an increase in giving. It's got to be much more strategic than that. You've got more competition, dollars are fewer. You've got to be much more thoughtful and much more deliberate as you go forward. So I want to share with this uh, some concepts with you today that I hope will help. I'd love to come back sometime or maybe do a podcast on what the best nonprofits do as far as major gifts and annual gifts, because that's changing too. Maybe we can do that one day in a podcast. All right, when we talk about, there are three types, basic types of gifts. There's three types of donors, two sources of assets, three important questions, and four giving techniques. We're gonna talk about these in some detail. Number one, too many nonprofits uh, look at donors and, and anticipate three types of gifts. They, they want the annual gift, they want a capital campaign gift. I assume you all have a lot of capital campaigns up here. Everywhere else I go, they have a lot of capital campaigns. And then you have the plan gifts, and we assume there's an arc here where you start with the annual gifts, you go to capital campaigns, major gifts, and then the plan gifts. That's just not reality. That's not how most people think. And what is realistic is to think about donors as individuals. Now, I first read this back in 1976 from a book by Harold Seymour that 70% of donors give based on habit. And I was pretty skeptical. And then there was 23% give based on emotion. They hear something, they see something, uh, and it sparks an interest, and they give because it's an emotional response. And then about 7%, he referred to as plan givers, we re referred to as strategic donors. The longer I do this, the more accurate those numbers are. It is it's fascinating to me. 70% of your donors give the same amount of money they have year after year, and they'll continue to give the same amount of money until you do what? What's the challenge with this donor? I think I heard it, what was it? Yeah. Yeah, that's right, having to give that, increase the gift, right? Be, and be more frequent with it. Very few of us actually do anything with habitual donors. We tend to treat them with direct mail and special events. And we've got to do more than that to be successful in the future. And then 23% give based on emotion. There's something they hear, there's something they see. 
And those gifts tend to be larger than habitual donor gifts, but they're far less frequent. Now, the group that we have built our career on are those strategic donors. They are, uh, I was describing to them last week in Baltimore, I did a conference in Baltimore, actually a couple of presentations in Baltimore last week, and one was on types of donors. And I talked about strategic donors. They tend to be a little bit cranky, tend to be very skeptical, they don't mind asking questions, and often we perceive that as just being obstinate. But the reality is they really care. And you find that board member or that individual that doesn't mind asking the question, the important question, is somebody you ought to listen to because there's a real interest there. They read everything. They, they, they love books. They love holding things in their hands. They love annual reports, even though they may not read all the annual reports. This is a group that tends to be wealthy. And it's, it's slow growth wealth, if that makes sense. That makes sense when I say that. It, it was earned over a long period of time. Didn't just happen. They tend to be very thoughtful. They tend to be very deliberate. They make really good decisions and they need information to make decisions. This group is a tremendous donor base. You could build a great hospital, a great facility on this group alone. Now, I want to come back to them in a few minutes because they're, they're different and they approach giving differently. They do not make gifts, they make investments. They expect a return on investment. They want to know how you manage the money, how you spend the money. Is it being spent wisely? And they'll ask the question that maybe no one else will ask. If I had to pick one group, that would be my group. Now, there may be, for the first time in our history, this group may actually be decreasing in size. And I'm not really sure why that's true. But it's, it's fascinating, it's a fascinating study. I think part of it was, as we talked this morning, uh, my parents were impact, impacted by two world events. What were they? My mom's in her late 80s. Depression, depression world, war world War II. How did the depression affect my parents and their generation? What were the lessons they learned out of that? So, what was that? Save. Save. My father was raised in South Chicago. He had two younger siblings. And when he was really small, during the Depression, my grandfather lost his job. My grandmother lost her job. They were living in a row house basement, if you know what that means. They had no income, no future income. They were out of milk, the water was off, electricity was off, they had no flour. And they took my dad and his two younger siblings to the train station downtown Chicago, put them on a train, and the train took them to Dixon, Illinois, where my dad's uncle lived on a farm. Now, what did they have on that farm in Dixon they didn't have back in Chicago? They had food, didn't they? They had the, all the meat they could eat. They had the vegetables. They had a garden. And so they were living comfortably while my grandparents in Chicago were really struggling. Did that have an impact on that generation? Uh, I was telling the group earlier this morning, you go to my mom and dad's house, you could pull out the drawer next to their oven, and they had all this aluminum foil folded for baked potatoes. That's, that's its only purpose. And one year when uh, my dad asked me to go out to the garage and pick up a screwdriver to put a great-grandchild's gift together, I went out there and I looked under his table and he had three bags full of bread wrapper clips. You know what I'm talking about, the plastic clips? And so I got a handful and I went in and I said, Dad, what, what is this about? And he goes, well, they're bread, bread wrapper clips. Like, I didn't know what they were. And I said, well, I knew that. <laughs> Why do you have three bags? He said, you never know when you're going to, what do you think he said? Need one. I said, have you ever used them? He said, it's not the point. I have them if I need them, right? My dad, he drove by the Braille method. He just, you know, he, he kept moving until he bumped into something. And uh, I'd ask him, I said, you know, you want to get another car? And he goes, oh, a car is just transportation. He was shaped by the Depression, but he was also shaped by World War II. What did World War II teach that generation? Sacrifice. Sacrifice for the common good. You know, in some parts of the country, when a farmer loses his hand, a corn picker, what do the other farmers do? Yeah. What do they do? They work for him. Yeah. They what? They work for 
That's right. They go get his crops in before they get their own crops in. There are still places in the country when someone gets sick, they take them food. I sense that in this part of the country, that while there are people who come in and out of the community, there's a sense of, of community. You, you believe in, in what's happening here. That is a great environment in which to be successful in raising money. But I think the reason that percent of 7% is decreasing is because that generation is decreasing. And I, I, can't, I can't document that, but that's just my inclination. Okay, one of the great lessons I learned in, uh, in visiting Pomona College, and someone earlier today had been to Pomona College, attended school there. Anybody else been to Pomona College in Los Angeles? Got about 1,100 students. I think they're ranked 24th in endowment in the United States. And I asked the guy when I was doing my dissertation, what's the one thing you know that no one else knows? And he took out a napkin, we are at McDonald's, and he drew an oval, and in it he put DI, which stood for discretionary income, and he drew all these arrows, and he said, Eddie, every nonprofit is asking donors to make gifts out of discretionary income. Write us a check. And they're competing with all the other charities. Is that still the case today? And he said, if you think about it, they're competing with going out to eat for some families on Friday night, going to a movie, going to eat. And he said, and every other nonprofit from their church to the synagogue, to the Boys and Girls Club, to the Why It Doesn't Matter, are asking for those same checks. And it's a limited pool of money. He said, the great organizations also ask for gifts of net worth. Now I want to tell you about a gentleman named Ed Jesse. You all wouldn't know Ed. He was a farmer in uh, Iowa that I worked with about seven years ago. And uh, when Ed came to see a university president, he went up and he waited in his office, the university president finally came out and Ed said, I need some financial help. And the president says, we don't do that here. You need to go see your banker. And the next day, he was at the hospital, Allen Hospital in Waterloo, Iowa, where his sister was having heart surgery. And he went to the, the director of development for the hospital and he said, I need some financial help. And that director of development was smart enough to say, what kind of help do you need? He said, I gotta figure out what to do with my estate. Okay. Ed died nine months ago. This little water, anybody been to Waterloo, Iowa? You okay? It's not very big, is it? They just got a $6.7 million check from his estate. Now, how long would it have taken that little hospital to raise that amount of money in cash? A long time. So my point is on this that we, he also said the great organizations ask for gifts of net worth. Where do most people today build their wealth? You have any idea? Equities. Equities. Off from the average person in, in retirement accounts, right? A lot of wealth being built in retirement accounts, especially true of physicians. Of all professional groups, physicians carry about 60 to 7% of their wealth in retirement accounts, which I find fascinating. So, not only are we going to go after gifts of discretionary income, we're also going after gifts of net worth. Now, when you think about this, there's three really important questions a donor has to ask and, and answer before they give a major gift. These are really important, and they're hard questions. Number one is, do I have enough money to live for the rest of my life? You think I'll tell the story about Miss P that I, I told this morning? I think I should, okay, I'll tell you. There's a lady, and we were talking about her uh, coming up here. Uh, that worked with this lady who looked like Granny on Beverly Hillbillies. Remember her, Irene? I never can remember her last name. But she looked just like her, little short lady, white hair, pulled back in a bun, had the Granny glasses. And I was sitting there with her, and this had been in, in 85, I think it was, 1985. And so I said, Miss P, how much money do you need to live on for the rest of your life? And she said, well, Eddie, how much do I have? And I said, you have 14.2 million. She says, I need it all. <laughs> she was 92. <laughs> and if she would have died that year, the federal government would have gotten $8.8 .8 million in taxes. And I said, and she, that bothered her. And I said, so why, why do you feel like you need to hold on to 14.2 million? And she said, what if I go to a nursing home? <laughs> and like I told the group this morning, I told her, you can buy a nursing home for 3 million, you still got 11 million two left over. But why did she feel like she didn't have enough to live on the rest of her life? We talked about that driving up. She grew up in the hills of West Virginia in a coal mine town 
where the only transportation in or out was a train. And the only store that came that they really had was a government store on the train. And once a week it'd come in, they'd move their cattle, their hogs back and forth. So she felt poor, was she? But why, what was so important about that is that you've got to answer that question, do I have enough to live on the rest of my life? And today, a lot of people don't know the answer to that question. They do when you, when you run the numbers, they know it, but they don't feel it. And so that's an important question that has to be addressed. Now here's the naughty one we talked about this morning. How much should I leave my heirs? Now, I don't think the question really is so much how much should we leave my heirs, but when should we give it to them? When my parents' generation passed away, they had the tendency to give everything to their children outright. That has changed dramatically in my career. Why, are, why do you think parents are hesitant giving their children too much too fast? What are some reasons? Pardon me? They might spend it all very quickly. Can you think of another reason? Sir? They may not work for it. It could be that they have an evil son-in-law. <laughs> or it could be that they have a grandchild with addictions. There are a lot of legitimate reasons that give us pause about giving too much money too quickly to our children. So the real question is, what is the best way to stage these gifts to our children over a period of time? And then the last question that we really think nonprofits need to be helping donors with is would they rather leave some of their estate to the IRS or to local charities? So if you pulled, if you pulled all of your donors and said, would you rather give some money to us or would you rather give it to the IRS, what percent would say the IRS? I can tell you, it's 3%. Explain that one. <laughs> they work for the IRS. <laughs> they work for the IRS. But they don't know they have that option. And one of the great challenges is for us to help them know they have that option. And so that's a very important tool that we'll talk about just very briefly. Number one is, if you look at the very beginning of the tax code, at least it used to be this way, the purpose of taxation is to redistribute wealth in America. That's the first sentence of the tax code. I don't know if it's still in there. It was when I, last time I looked. And there's a certain amount of money referred to as social capital. So when you get a paycheck, do you get to keep 100% of that paycheck? Well, he does, huh? <laughs> no, there's a certain amount of money called social capital that's collected in a tax that has to be used for society's benefit. You don't have a choice in how much that is, do you? You can't say one year, you know, I think 28% is too much. I think I'll cut it down to 15%. And when you also pass away and you leave assets in your estate, the IRS, according to Congress, says there's some other shots we have at some of your assets. And so I can earn as much money as I want. Some of the money can be used for my financial independence. Some can be passed on to my heirs. But some has to be given to society, almost always collect in the form of a tax. Here's one of the most important messages I can get out today. You have a choice with that. You have a clear choice. You can give some of this money to the IRS or you can give it to local charities. Which would you prefer? Which is going to be done according to your estate plan? I mean, that's a, that's a huge question. And if we can show you not only how to take that money that normally goes to the IRS, but actually get more money to heirs or an equal amount to heirs and help charity, it would that be something you're interested in? Now, what we think is a better solution is to take that, that social capital and you direct it. Now think of the good that could be done in this community if we kept money that normally flows from the estate to the IRS, kept it in local, to help local charities. Do you think it would make a difference? Would it be a staggering amount of money? Do you mind telling what you said a while ago to me? Do you mind sharing? Yeah, he said when his children found out they wouldn't get less, it'd be okay, but you can also decide to help charities too. It's exactly right. So what we think is if we can get people to pause and answer the question, would you rather give to local charities or the IRS, they'll pick local charities. I, I promise you, they will. We just got to get that message out. It's huge. Listen, Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Vanderbilt, 
Stanford, I'm trying to think of the largest endowments in the country, did not grow to the level they're at today with people writing checks. They came from estate gifts. If you want to endow your organization's future, you've got to have these gifts too. And they come from that 7% strategic donors. You've got to have that effort in there. Uh, many donors today do not have the discretionary income they once had. I don't know if that's true of, of you and your family, but it's true of a lot of families. Or they're concerned that they might outlive their resources. I told the group earlier this morning that Saturday, my mom, who was 89, got really teary-eyed and said, Eddie, I think I'm going to run out of money. And I said, well, what's happened? Why? She goes, I don't know. I just feel like I'm going to run out of money. And that's a legitimate fear for her. It's not realistic, but it's legitimate. And so we're finding that people, especially my mom and dad's generation, which had been so incredibly generous, that the group from 70 up are the most generous generation in world history. Not U.S. history, world history. There's never been a generation that comes close. And my generation is not fulfilling their shoes. We're consuming. My generation and younger is a consuming generation. We buy a lot. You know, we have to have the newest and latest of this and that. And as long as we can finance it, we get it. So with that in mind, it's an important question to ask donors. If they feel like they can't write another check, would they be willing to consider another way, uh, maybe even a better way for them to include charity? So the four types of gift people are making today, they're making gifts of net worth. You're finding people who are giving land. Uh, the, in the past we've had, you can give up to $100,000 out of your IRA to charity, uh, coming directly out of your IRA account. You're finding more and more testamentary gifts and gifts that provide income, especially this third one. We're seeing more and more people doing charitable gift annuities. I don't know if you're seeing those, Megan, here. Boy, are you, uh, anybody else seeing gift annuities? They are awesome. I wish I had a couple slides on charitable gift annuities. Charitable gift annuities, uh, when you make that gift to charity, it's a split interest gift. Just a brief, brief statement about it. It's a split interest gift. And my mom, for example, is getting 7.2% return because part of that's return of principal. So 75% of her income is tax free. That's based on age. And she got a charitable deduction of about 56% uh, on that charitable gift annuity. It is one of the greatest things out there for people who are living on CDs right now. There's nothing that's equal. So there are gifts that provide income and the gifts that fulfill the state planning objective. How many remember this? How many can still tell us what these are? I sure couldn't. Well, that's the, uh, the tool we learned back in chemistry class back in high school and college. Well, this is ours. So what we do when we go through the state planning process, for, as a board member, you need to know, first thing we do is we give husband and wife a questionnaire if they're a couple, and we ask, what do you believe, what do you think, what do you feel? And the next thing we do is we get a net worth statement, and then we'll sit down, we have an actual estate planning team. There's about, we have about 50 in our firm, 55 in our firm, about 45 attorneys. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the number. And we sit down, we have a planning team of 10 attorneys, and we look at every single estate, we look at the, their current objectives, we look at this table, we look at state and federal tax law, and we come back with our recommendations. So it's a very thoughtful, deliberate process. And what we find is that individuals, when they're given a chance to really think this through and slow down, not be in a hurry, have a chance to really think these things through, they tend to be very charitable. That's the great thing about it. Now, I'm gonna ask you to look up here for just a second while you continue eating. And I want to ask you that you ignore these numbers for just a minute. What we normally have seen historically is that there's three ways to leave money to your children. And it is not dependent on the size of your estate. It's irrelevant or the type of assets. You can give money to your children outright at the death of the second spouse if you're a couple or if you pass away as an individual. You can set money aside in what's called a spendthrift trust that provides annual income to heirs. Or you can make lump sum payments, maybe for your grandchildren. When the, when the youngest reaches 25, they get a lump sum. When the next one reaches 30, whatever it may be, they get lump sum payments. And what we suggest is that people use all three tools. Now here's the why. This is the most important part about this slide. 
If I leave $100,000 to my son and he goes through a divorce, can some of that money be taken from him? Yes. If he is driving a car and it goes to an intersection and is talking on a cell phone and he hits somebody and hurts them, can some of that money be taken from them? Yes. If he files for bankruptcy, can some of that money be taken from him? Why do we give money to our children? To protect them, right? So what the very wealthy have done for years is they decide they'll give a little bit outright and they're gonna draw a wall right here. And that wall, they're gonna create two trusts, two types of trust. They may use one or both of them, but this trust provides annual income to heirs for a period of time. And then this trust up here provides lump sum payments over a period of time. That money cannot be taken from them. Now, I, I was trying to think earlier, uh, what day is this? What, is this a Monday? What day is it? Tuesday. Two weeks ago, Thursday, the, I, the court, Supreme Court ruled on something that caught all of us by surprise. I had no clue this was even being discussed. Nine to zero. Historically, if I took, at my death, if I gave my children a retirement account, they got a stretch IRA, that money was protected from litigation. The courts ruled nine to nothing that money can be attached in, in litigation. First time, I, I, that sent shockwaves through our industry. I had no clue that would take place. So what you can do is you can take your retirement account at your death and roll it into one of these trusts. That does protect it from litigation. So even if you had a plan two weeks ago, you ought to pause and have it reviewed again. And uh, now the question is, what percent of the legal community know this? I don't know. It, it just happened, so we'll see. Now let me show you some reasons to consider using some charitable trust. I'll get past that, it's too confusing. This is the best description I've ever seen of a trust. You, and, and really a trust is nothing more than a contractual agreement between you and the trustee. That is all it is. It, it sounds fancier than it is, but the truth is it's a document that you agree to and a trustee agrees to. And so you have the person who's creating the trust, the grantor trust, and the trust is being managed by a trustee. It could be a bank, it could be an individual. You could be the trustee of that trust. But a trust always has two types of beneficiaries. Has a remainder beneficiary. These are the individuals that get the resources when the trust comes to term, when the trust ends. They get what's ever left in that trust, okay? Then you have the income beneficiary, which has to benefit each year from this trust. Now, are there any tax advantages in making one of these types of beneficiaries a charity? Absolutely. The, the senator I just finished doing his estate, he did exactly that. He made it, the death of he and his wife, the income beneficiary is gonna be a, a university that he attended and a hospital that gave him treatment. And there are enormous benefits to his remainder beneficiaries in doing that. And, uh, staggering benefits. So I want to just show you some quick illustrations. I'm back up here so I can see them too. As we look at this, and all I want you to see is the before and after, and how we use what's called social capital. What we do with social capital, the money that normally goes to the IRS, we direct it to a charitable trust. So the heirs do not own that trust, but they can benefit from it. So we take money that normally does not, is not going to go to them and allow it for their benefit. So what I want you to focus on as I show you these slides are these boxes right up here, okay? Before planning, and I'm going to show you after planning. This is a couple, $9.3 million in nice estate. Before planning, heirs were going to get $7,200,000. How much to charity? How much in taxes? Now they had $2.4 million in retirement accounts, okay? With planning, they wanted to give 10% of their estate to charity, so that's 720,000, right? So after planning, heirs are gonna get how much? Can you read that, 6,450,000? That's still more than the 7,002,000 minus the 930,000. That was the 10% of that amount of money. So heirs are getting more than was anticipated. How much to charity? How much in taxes? So compare these, how much there, how much there? How much here in taxes, how much here in taxes? You think they like that plan? Mm -hmm. 
This little, uh, little smaller estate's a three million. So does this have any estate tax consequences? No, it's too small, right? But I want you to notice what we did up here. How much the heirs before planning? Can you read that? Two million, let's say two million nine. How much to charity? Zero. How much in taxes? Now with our plan, how much to heirs? How much to charity? How much in taxes? And if you, even if you present value, and our present value is three and a half percent, it's still a staggering amount of money to heirs. And taking money that normally goes to the IRS, again, and giving it to charity. Now, if uh, Megan, if they want these slides, can you get them to them? Yeah. Okay. So if you want to go back, if you're an accountant or attorney, you want to know the numbers, uh, we give you the slides and you can work with them. A little, little more interesting estate. This is a estate. The wife is worth $30 million. She has her own business, privately held company. Her husband's worth $2 million. Six. This is a bland, blended family. Uh, the wife wants her business to pass to her children but she wants her stepdaughter to be the CEO. <laughs> I told the group earlier today, I want to see that. I want to see how that's going to work out for her. But she had a $10 million islet. Her, her net worth is $30 million in addition to the $10 million. His is $2 million six. How much is going to go to charity with our plan? Zero before. Now it's $15 million. Is that not amazing? And what we did is use a series of lead trusts. So how that's going to work is this trust is created for five years. For five years, it pays income to charity. At the end of five years, it's a lump sum to heirs. Does that make sense? Then this trust paying income to charity for 10 years, then the lump sum to heirs. 15 years to charity, then lump sum to heirs. 20 years to charity, then lump sum to heirs. The very, very wealthy have been using these tools forever. How many remember 10 years ago that Ted Turner gave a billion dollars to the UN? Anybody remember that? You know what? He didn't give a billion dollars to the UN. He set a billion dollars in a charitable lead trust just like this, paying charity the income at the end of 10 years, that billion dollars goes to his children. So my point is these are tools used by people with exceptional wealth that can be used by people with more modest wealth. Okay. Uh, so, so what we're finding is that we do about 3,000 estates a year, and um, we, we generate a little over a billion dollars last year to charity. If, I, if my numbers are correct, I think it was a billion, 30 million. And here's how we did it. What we're finding is that the vast majority of people at the death of the second spouse of their couple want to give about 20% of their assets to heirs outright. They want to give them something. They may not want to give it all to them at one time. They want to set 40% aside as a stream of income to heirs. And then 40% as lump sum payments to heirs, much like that trust I just showed you, lump sum payments escalating in value. There are enormous benefits in doing this. Some are charitable. Okay? There's another estate. This is an estate planning attorney who's also a very successful business owner. He had $2.8 million in a Cupert, and I don't, I've, I've never seen a Cupert in Idaho. Qualified personal, you, have, you got one? Boy, they're rare. It, it, and they're usually the homes you want to pass on to children. Is that why you did it? Excellent. That's, you, are, you are smart, your advisors are smart for doing that. that. That is something that everybody who has a second home ought to at least look at, a Cupert. And then they have $100,000 in an islet. They had a family trust of 35 million. He still had 18 million left in his estate. He had already created 5.8 million in a private foundation. Now, his heirs with this 18 million were going to get right at 13 million. He did have more charitable intent, another 525,000. Still going to pay 7.4 million in taxes. If he follows our recommended plan, I'm going to drop down the present value for those who are, are attorneys or accountants. Air is going to get 11 million one instead of 12 million nine. He's going to give an additional 5.6 million to charity compared to 525, and instead of paying uh, 7.4 million in taxes, he's going to pay 4 million 100 thousand in taxes. This guy is he is he's he's one of the sharpest men I've ever worked with. Really bright estate planning attorney, and he had all of this up here was already in place, and that was the consequence of it. This is what we brought to the table. And here's the consequence to that.
Now, if you don't present value, heirs, instead of getting 12 million, are going to get 24 million. So the charity getting, uh, instead of getting 5 million, 6, we'd get 10 million. So those are, that's future value of dollars is why we, we include that. Okay, this is a $54 million estate. Uh, current plan, 21 million going to heirs, 19 million to charity, and then 13 million in taxes. If he follows our plan, we're gonna drop down the present value. Uh, instead of charity, and heirs getting 21 million, they're gonna get 24 million. Instead of 19 million to charity, getting 25 million to charity. Instead of 13 million in taxes, five million to in taxes. So my point in showing this is that it really, it can be a small estate, it can be a large estate, it really doesn't matter. Tax laws can be used, it doesn't matter the size of the estate. The great thing is the vast majority of people would rather help local charities than the IRS. Now, we can't always eliminate taxes. However, we just did a $57 million estate with zero estate tax. That was fun. But that's pretty rare. The reality is that it's, it's typically we can really help. We can't solve all the problems. We can't fix everything. But the real question is, would people rather give to local charities or the IRS? That's the fundamental question. I bet people in Idaho and where you came from would rather give to local charities. It's more likely that I'll grow hair than they would say no to that proposition. So the way to do this is number one, nice and easy. I don't believe in games, gimmicks, or tricks. I think just good information is all people need. Secondly, and, and uh, I think you mentioned earlier, Danny, to tell how we work. We do not draft documents. Uh, we do not sell products and we do not manage money. We're pure planners. Our job is to help you, and that's what we're paid to do. And the board, when they brought us on five years ago, they said, when I, start, I started the company 20 some odd years ago, you know, I just wanted a company that was replete with integrity. I mean, I didn't want to trick anybody, and I, I knew I couldn't make it as a salesman, but I thought if I could find and take these tax laws that are written in such ways to incentivize these gifts, Congress incentivizes these gifts because they know you can do more as a charity to help than they can do as a government. And a good illustration is the VA hospitals and your hospital, right? You can do it better. A board overseeing a nonprofit is more effective than a government agency. That's just the facts. I mean, we don't have to argue that. And so they wrote tax law in such a way as to incentivize these gifts. And so what I would suggest is that you truly put the donor's needs first. Whatever is best for the donor is best for the nonprofit. It really is. Don't try, to, don't try to get them to do more than they want to do. If they want to give you something rather than the IRS, be grateful you get it. And it may take a while, but it's still better to wait for it. Second, help them achieve their objectives, their goals. What is best for you and your family? What is right for you? What is the best way to help you? If you really approach it from a servant attitude, remember that book, Servant Attitude, that came out years ago in, in business? That's exactly right. What is best for the donor is best for the nonprofit, no matter our consequences. I just believe if you do what's right, you're gonna get the right results. I, I just, I know it's true. You do too. Number three, show them the better use of social capital. Rather than saying, let me get, let me get you to give a gift. You know, I hate this idea when someone comes and says, we had a committee meeting, and in that committee, we decided you ought to give us $100,000. <laughs> that, to me, doesn't feel right. Does it feel right to you? But saying to them, you know, if you'd rather give to us than the IRS, we would love to help you with that. To me, that's a much better approach. Give them time to think about it. Don't be in a rush. Don't be in a hurry. You know, what we're finding, I just did an estate, a $39 million gift and this is the third time this guy's been through the planning process. The first two times he didn't give anything to charity. Third time. Took nine years. 39 million dollars. Was it worth it? You know, nice and easy. Don't try to push people. I do not believe in pressure. I don't think that works. And I don't think you'll see with, with, with Alan. He won't do that either. And then the last thing is to trust your donors. If you give them good information, they're going to make good decisions. And it's going to benefit nonprofits. They, listen, the people who make gifts to charity are good people, just decent people who want to help, who want to help their family. You know, one of the most interesting things, we did an analysis recently on 
why people give to charity. Giving to charity was not number one in their list of objectives. What do you think number one was for a couple? Take care of surviving spouse, right? Number two, what do you think was number two? We think it was charity, children. Number three, what do you think number three was? Reduce taxes or grandchildren. They were tied. Fourth was to give to charity. But look at the consequences of taking them through that process. Nice and easy. You take care of issue number one, take issue of number two, take care of issue number three. Then you can talk about number four. Would you rather give to the IRS or charity? Nice and easy. Nice and easy. No pressure. Do what's best for them. Do it with integrity. And the more I do this, the longer I do this, and our company's been really, you know, we've been a lot more successful than we ever thought we would be. And there's nobody else in this country doing what we do. We're it. Because everybody else has something to sell or something to draft. And we simply want to help. And, and it's paid enormous dividends. So that's it. If you get a chance to, uh, some of you have been through the planning process. I don't know how many. I know some of you have been. Uh, I would encourage you to go through if you haven't. I think it would be something worth your while. If you get into it and find out it's not what you want to do, just quit. We get paid exact. We get paid the same no matter what you do. And uh, the other thing I would tell you, and this, I didn't mention this earlier this morning either, everything we discuss in our meetings is held in confidence. We don't come back and tell Megan or anybody else on the board what you're worth or what you're going to do with it. That's, that's your business, not, not theirs. So we believe in confidentiality, and we think that's one of the keys to our success, and second is integrity. I, I think integrity is everything. And so we're not going to try to convince you to give to the hospital if you go through the planning process. If you want to give, that's great. That's not our job. That's her job, right? Others' job. That's not my job. My job is to help you figure out what to do. You want to ask any questions? Anything? Yes, sir. Yeah, this morning, in this morning session, I'd like you to expand on it because I found it fascinating, and I think some of the older people in the group will, is the change in distribution for the lump sum from the old traditional 23, 25, and 27 to where it's going now. Yeah. Uh, that has happened in the last eight or nine years. You used to see lump sum trusts when they were typically, uh, you'd see them sometimes as young as 19 to 20, but it typically was 23, and they would give five-year payments. In the last eight or nine years, you've seen that shift dramatically to where the first payment comes out when the youngest is 50, next is 55, next 60 and 65, the largest payment being 65, unless there's grandchildren involved. And that's typically when they reach 40. Now. You know, for, I don't know why I was so slow picking up on this, but I was. I was just, every time someone would say that, I was startled. And then one day I got to realizing that we worry about our children having enough to retire. I mean, I think my kids are going to be fine until retirement. I hope they have enough when they retire. Is that, you think that's typical? I think for a lot of us, it's, we're a little concerned about that. I, I just told them this morning, too, I worked with a guy who had a $1.6 billion estate. That's a lot of money anywhere. And he said he didn't want to spoil his kids. He was only given each $50 million. <laughs> uh, man, I'd like to be on that list. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, that answer your question or make it fill, fill time. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You can go back today and say there's something so unique to this valley. And that is there's a lot of high wealth in people here who don't live here. Yes. It's a second or third home. I've only been involved for maybe a couple months with the foundation. I've asked about 10 of them who are very wealthy. And you know what they always say? I give to Eisenhower, I give yeah. to Stanford. I don't live here. So yeah. we as a board, we need to have that group. Oh, that goes back to what we talked about this morning. You're exactly right. You've got to build relationships and have conversations. Well, it's hard to get them to realize yeah. that they, you know, they do spend time here. Yeah. They can have a heart attack here. Yeah. They can and yeah. And, uh, yeah, if you have a heart attack here, they're not going to fly to Eisenhower, even though Eisenhower is a good client of ours. Yeah, yeah, you, but you've got the, you've taken the right step well, in talking with them. But it's it's not easy. We have uh, we have Napa, which is kind of like that. We have a lot of people who are in and out of Napa. Uh, someone's in Florida. Or you have a place in Florida too. We have a lot of transit people in Florida too. But it just takes time. You can't rush it. And um, the first pass on them typically is not overly successful. We just, that's exactly what we talked about this morning. You're exactly right. 
This is unique, and yet, uh, if we can ever get them to realize they may have some health care needs here, too, sure. we're smart to do well, that. Well, that's, that's the obvious. Yeah, question. yeah, that's, that's a great question. Yes, ma'am. sat down with him, I told him there was, I have no children, and my husband and I have no children. Um, when I sat down with him, I told him, well, there is a Pacific fund in our state that I want 50% to go to my niece, and that I had told our attorney who drafted our wills and trust up about five years before that I wanted this certain amount of money to go to this niece. So I think on our fourth meeting, Alan sat down with us and said, do you know that 50% of your entire state is going to your niece? Oh my God, I, you know, I had no idea. The attorney, when he drafted it, thought I meant 50% of everything. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was just an astounding thing. And it was such a, and I read the will, but it was right. such attention to detail that yeah. your people have that oh, I was you. really impressed with. Thank you. You know, uh, when we do a lot of continual legal education classes, and we tell them all the time, we find about a 70% error rate. 70%. 70. 70%. And I'll tell you what I found last week. I, I'm working with an executive director of a nonprofit who's very wealthy, and she had included her nonprofit in her estate plan. She had her documents. We'd worked with her. We met with her eight or nine times. We were sitting down and reviewing her estate plan. I read through it thoroughly. Read it again. Went that article four again, and I said, Donna, there's nothing to charity in here. She said, oh yeah, I, I told him I wouldn't include charity. So she went back to the attorney, and the attorney says, we, I just think you're giving too much to charity. Yeah. <laughs> kind of similar to what we, in the, what we were talking about earlier, and she, and she said, you know, that's not your decision, and I'm gonna miss you. <laughs> She said, I miss you. That's so cool. I, I appreciate your comments on that. I mean, the, the de devil's in the details. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're, we, have the, I, we have the greatest company in the world. We have the greatest people. I'm so proud of them. So very proud of them. Any other questions? Yes. Eddie, I think we're most successful when folks are, are brought into the process through word of mouth in the community. Um, can you give us some examples of how to coach that when we're out and about at cocktail parties or in the yeah. community? You know, uh, it used to be we thought we need to have seminars and invite people in and they would come to the seminar and they would all sign up. That doesn't work. What we do find is if you have one or two people that you have influence with, kind of going back to your comment, and just say, I'd like you to hear something. You may or may not be ready, but I'd like for you to hear it. And, and the good thing is we love Eisenhower too. <laughs> you know, I got an email from Eisenhower this morning. And, but for a lot of people, we, we want to give local too. You know, if you give to Eisenhower, you know how many, you know how many donors have given 100,000 or more to Eisenhower? It's staggering. How many donors have given 100,000 or more here? Smaller number. Yeah. So you can have a big impact here too. So I think your comment and, and breaching those two of just nice and easy, bring in two or three and say, this has been our experience. Maybe let Alan come in and talk for five minutes, tell them what they do. And because you can help a lot more than you can do on your own. And uh, I don't think you ever have to be ashamed or embarrassed to introduce someone to our services. We're not going to scare them. I promise you, we're not going to scare them. Now, I'll tell you where we get no's typically. We get no's typically when mom and dad do not agree and they're already fighting. And I've had three couples in my 37 years who didn't finish. One was last year. He was 94, she was 93, he was filed, or she was filed on divorce on him. Because they had a, an $82 million estate, they had five children, three wanted mom and dad to do one thing, two wanted mom and dad to do another thing, and they got mom and dad in a fight, shame on them. For money, for money, got them in a fight on that. So, but normally if we can get them in a room and talk to them and show them what we do, uh, you'll have a lot sign up. So just feel comfortable introducing them. And, and, and don't hesitate to do that. We, we won't embarrass you, I promise you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you all. I, I believe in what you all are doing. I'm, I, I, I'm a big fan of the people here, and you've got some really solid board members. 
you've done a great job, and you're above average client, I will tell you that. And uh, I don't get to say that very often, because not everybody's above average. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a great part of the country, and thank you for your time today. I hope it's helpful.